Flood Conference and is concluding, uh, concluded with a plenary uh, talk by Paul Clement, partner of Kirkland Ellis, noted Supreme Court litigator and uh, native of Cedarburg, Wisconsin. And we're here to talk about uh, his experience arguing before the Supreme Court. He's argued more cases than anyone in the modern era. Welcome, Paul. It's great to be with you. Thanks. It's good to be home. So a lot of questions, as one can expect during the plenary, about um, the Supreme Court, what's going on, some of the hot-button issues there, some of the cases, the leak investigation. I wanted to start by asking you something um, that was reported just the other day. John Eastman, a lawyer who's at the center of, of a lot of the January 6th investigation, apparently sent an email in which he mentioned there's a heated debate going on in the court about whether or not to grant cert on one of the election challenges. And he, he's a former clerk uh, of Thomas, you're a former clerk of... Justice Scalia, and I just wondered, assuming that's true and that he had some knowledge of that by virtue of his clerkship, I mean, is that, do, the, do, you, do, you, do you talk with the justices you used to clerk for after you're a clerk? And if, if, he, if, if indeed, if he got that from inside, I mean, what, what kind of breach or how unusual is that? So generally speaking, once you're done clerking, you don't have really any access to what's going on sort mm -hmm. of behind the scenes. Um, and that doesn't mean that you don't see justices occasionally socially in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. or other law clerks and stuff like that. But, you know, in, in the normal course, you wouldn't expect anybody to have mm -hmm. um, access to those kind of situations. But, you know, that doesn't mean that, you know, some, sometimes people perceive that they have information mm -hmm. or they, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's that one of the oldest sayings in Washington, D.C. and probably in Madison, I'm guessing, is, you know, those those who know don't talk and those who talk uh, don't know. Um, and, you know, so sometimes you hear and, and, and I mean, even when there's no bad faith on anybody's part, sure. people will say that they have a perception that um, that the court's about to do something. You know, the court, as, as you may know, they're in, they're in the time of the year where they're releasing opinions. And I would say every year at this time of the year, I have, you know, somebody reach out to me and say, I you know, I've, I've heard a hot rumor that the court is going to decide case X today. Um, and unless it's the last day of the term, um, when the court traditionally releases all its mm -hmm. remaining opinions, mm -hmm. like nobody knows that. And in every case I can remember, uh, it turned out it wasn't right. And it turned out it was just that somebody learned that, you know, today was a decision day. And since their case was one of the ones that hadn't been decided yet, they put two and two together and got seven and concluded that today's the day our case is coming out. Great, great. Let's talk a little bit about the, the investigation that uh, the Chief Justice has ordered into the leak of the draft opinion uh, on the Mississippi abortion case. You Again, you clerked at the Supreme Court for Justice Scalia. What, talk about some of the pressures you imagine the clerks now facing under this kind of unprecedented investigation. What must that be like for them? I, obviously, I can only speculate, mm -hmm. and you know, as I as I as I said at the plenary session, for the perspective of those who clerked on the court, the release of an entire draft opinion, you know, long before it was supposed to be issued, is just unthinkable. Mm -hmm. And so, like, even apart from the fact that there's an actual investigation going on, I think that the the release of that opinion has to just have kind of soured a lot of relationships, raised suspicions. You know, when all, when all is said and done, this may this may not involve a clerk, you know, at all, or, mm -hmm. you know, who knows? Who knows what the ultimate um, outcome or whether we'll ever know. Mm -hmm. But just as soon as something this out of the ordinary happens, it just changes the dynamic um, immediately. And then on top of that, you know, with, with an investigation going on, obviously nothing ever I ever had to deal with, but I know how seriously the justices in the court kind of take principles of confidentiality. So it just, unfortunately, I'm afraid that the, that the leak has taken what should be the best year professionally for the mm. law clerks and turned it into kind of a you know, strange and probably tense time up at the court. Do you think it'll impact the ability of people applying to be clerks in the future? No. I mean, it's still, still a great legal job. It's right. still a you know, stepping stone to... A lot of things. So I, I, I really, I'd be surprised if there's one person who would otherwise apply to be a Supreme Court clerk who won't. But at the same time, you know, it may take. You know, I mean, hopefully this is a blip. Hopefully this never happens mm -hmm. again. Hopefully the chief and the marshal get to the bottom of this, and it's not a law clerk, and then things can probably uh, go back to normal. But you know, it may take a year or two. 
Well, you mentioned it being undoubtedly a strange and upsetting experience for them, and given how monastic the Supreme Court is, I found myself thinking of that movie, The Name of the Rose, <laughs> which is uh, about a, it's a novel by Umberto Eco, and then was made into a film, and it's about a murder mystery inside a medieval um, Italian monastery. And it's great entertainment, right? But we're talking about one of our co-equal branch, branches of government, not a fictional monastery. Yeah, uh, and, and it, it pays to stop and take stock of the fact that in a way, it's it's a blessing that we're talking about this being completely unprecedented, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's unthinkable to those of us that have clerked on the court, but most other institutions in Washington leak all the time. It's right. not, you know, if some new proposed rule comes out beforehand in a draft form or somebody in Congress, you know, is told something in confidence by somebody in the executive and then tells it on the nightly news, no, nobody really bats an eye. So there, there is a, a sense in which you can reflect on this and how anomalous it is and say that it, you know, that, that the fact that it hasn't happened to this degree previously to the court is, is a positive thing for the institution. And hopefully this will just be, just be a blip. So we've just had a uh, appointment to the Supreme Court, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, like you, a Harvard law grad. Uh, one of the other judges who had been shortlisted for that position was Michelle Childs, public law school graduate at the University of South Carolina. And there was a lot of talk at the time about everybody up there has an Ivy League degree. Why don't we get someone from a big public? What about that argument? Why not let somebody from Michigan or Stanford or even even UW-Madison uh, have a shot and, and maybe bring a different perspective? Yeah, so I, if we're going to start with public school law schools, let's not start with Michigan. I mean, for goodness <laughs> sakes. Um, but, uh, but Wisconsin, I think, would be great. Look, I think there's a couple of different ways to look at this. I mean, obviously, you know, Notre Dame Law School is not a, a, a public law school, but it's Neither not... Neither Stanford, actually, you know, but Yeah, right. No, and, but, but, you know, Notre Dame is sort of further off of the uh, sort of Ivy League mm-hmm. kind of traditional track than Stanford. Um, and yet Justice Barrett was a graduate from, from, from Notre Dame, and I think her undergrad is Tulane. I could be wrong mm-hmm. about that. But so, so on the one hand, a lot of the justices did graduate from Harvard and Yale, and mm-hmm. uh, Justice Jackson will um, contribute to the, the Harvard contingent. And as a Harvard alum, I, it, you know, I would say it beats Yale. But, um, but, uh, but you know, another way of kind of looking at this is, I, I do think there's lots of different ways to get diversity on the court, and there are lots of limitations to how much diversity you can have mm-hmm. on an institution that only has nine members, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I think it'd be great if sort of other law schools were represented over time. I think it's great if, you know, people from, you know, different regions of the country um, are on the court. Um, you know, J- J- Justice Jackson, um, who is, you know, somebody I know and is going to do a great job. But, you know, in addition to, you know, having a kind of more typical academic background, um, you know, she's also D.C. based. Um, and, you know, there's something to be said for getting kind of different perspectives, particularly on uh, federalism issues um, for people who have, you know, kind of spent more time, <coughs> excuse me, Outside of Washington, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think like if you think back a couple of years, Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor were two of the biggest proponents of federalism on the Supreme Court, and I think that's at least in part because you know they spent their formative years outside of Washington. Yeah, they're D. both C. Arizonans. Yeah, well, and I, I, I still like to think of Chief Justice Rehnquist as a Shorewood guy, but yeah, they both came from you know, and and Chief Justice Rehnquist certainly spent some time. Uh, in the Justice Department in Washington, D.C., but he principally you know, spent his legal career in Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. You uh, were a keen participant in debate in high school. You also participated in the debate association at Georgetown where you did your undergraduate. Can you talk a little bit about um, both how that differs from an appellate argument, but yet how that inspired you to uh, go into appellate law? Sure, happy to. I, I think debate is such a great kind of training ground for so many things. And obviously, there are enough sort of similarities between debate and litigation that you do find a lot of litigators have debate in their background. I I think that, sure, there are definitely differences. And uh, the principal difference is that when you're litigating, you have like an actual client. Um, So it's not just an abstraction. It's not just academic. Um, You know, sometimes, particularly when your client's an individual, um, if it's in a criminal case where your client is, you know, looking at 
losing their liberty. I mean, the stakes are just different, and, and that obviously uh, affects things dramatically. But a lot of the skills that you can use in debate in terms of kind of thinking about argumentation, thinking about oral presentations are really quite similar and translate very well, I think. I also think that debate is great because it forces people to kind of think about both sides of the issue. Uh, that's a great skill for a litigator, but frankly, I think that's a great skill for everybody. Um, you know, as, as, as our society becomes kind of more divided, I think some people, you know, are, are critical of just, you know, opinions they disagree with. And I think if you're a high school student or a college student and the discipline forces you to argue X in the morning and not X in the afternoon, it just gives you a way of kind of appreciating that there are good and bad arguments on both sides of issues and there is uh, a lot of virtue in just kind of listening to the other side and actually hearing what they're saying and then coming up with the best response to it as opposed to just kind of negatively reacting to it. You know, if you, if, if, if you just kind of reflexively think the other side is wrong in debate, you're not going to win. Right. I mean, you know, it, it, the discipline forces you to, to articulate why the other side is wrong. Uh, and to do that, you have to listen pretty carefully and mm. take notes and all sorts of skills that I think translate to litigators. You uh, studied foreign, in the Foreign Service uh, School at Georgetown when you were an undergrad, and then you clerked for Judge Silberman on the D.C. Circuit before you clerked for Justice Scalia. Judge Silberman had been the ambassador to Yugoslavia. Did you ever think about maybe going the Foreign Service route instead of appellate law? I, I definitely thought about that as a possibility. I also did a master's degree in economics, and so at one point or another I thought about maybe getting an econ Ph.D., um, so all of those are kind of you know potential paths that uh, that that I could have gone, um, but I certainly don't regret going the uh, the legal path. And I think that was always for me kind of the the dominant sort of path. Like I considered alternatives, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I had an older brother who was in law school, like at the point I was in like middle school. So the idea of going to law school and becoming a lawyer was something that was always kind of real and present mm -hmm. to me because of my brother. And then with the debate and all of that, just seemed like something that, you know, would, would be a good fit. You've worked on Capitol Hill. Uh, you worked in the, in, the, in, the, in the building there. You were um, chief counsel to a subcommittee to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Having that experience, having worked in that building, what were, what were your thoughts when you were watching January 6th unfold? Well, you know, if you worked in those buildings, you know, you sort of, again, it's, it's, it's a little like the court where you sort of think that certain things are unthinkable. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this release of the opinion. And if you work in Capitol Hill, you just sort of view that as kind of the citadel of our democracy. Mm -hmm. And you just think that there's just no way something like that could happen. And yet, you know, it, it obviously did. But I think having you know, worked in the Senate Hart office building, the Senate Dirksen office building, um, you know, the idea, like, even when you're a staffer, I, I guess one way to put this is, even when you're a staffer, um, you spend most of your time in one of these auxiliary buildings, mm -hmm. and when you go over and to the Capitol, mm -hmm. um, you, you, you get a little tingle on the back mm -hmm. of your spine, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, you're kind of like, this is, this is prime time, um, and, you know, a couple of times when I was working on the Hill, I would you know, kind of assist the senator um, with a speech that he was giving in the well of the Senate mm -hmm. and would get to sort of sit behind him as he sometimes CNA do. And that just seemed like such a awesome opportunity to just be there even in a staff role. It's just kind of unthinkable that that kind of citadel um, with, you know, was, 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 was pierced the way it was on January 6th. Pivoting a little bit, and this will be the last question. One of the questions, one of the questions you were asked in the pl closing plenary was what you wore during the Supreme Court arguments that happened, occurred remotely, and of course with no no video, just audio. And you said Wisconsin sports jerseys. I'm wondering if a certain jersey had a better win loss record than another one. Like maybe the Packers did better than the Brewers, or was there any any breakdown that way? Or see, I was very blessed because um, I, I I I did five arguments in the telephonic format. Okay. Um, and my clients prevailed in all five. So, uh, you know, this is good. This is like, 
like a sausage race ending in a tie or something. You don't you don't have to say that like you know the Packers jersey kind of beat out the Brewers jersey or I actually didn't you know in fairness I didn't wear a Bucks jersey I wore a, I, I wore a Giannis uh, Greece jersey. Okay, uh, but I still think that counts as a sufficient Wisconsin connection. But uh, but they all they they all were undefeated. Well, given given your experience as a litigator, I think that probably had more to do with who was wearing the jersey than the jersey. So. You're kind to say that. (laughs) Okay, thank you. Paul Clement, Supreme Court advocate, Wisconsin native. Thank you. Great to be with you. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.